Well, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest today. John Kelsey is Associate Dean for Humanities in the College of Arts and Sciences at Florida State University, as well as Distinguished Research Professor in the FSU Department of Religion. His research and teaching focus on questions of political ethics, particularly in connection with Muslim and Christian thought. Professor Kelsey's recent publications include Arguing the Just War in Islam, published with Harvard University Press in 2007. He has received fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, Princeton University Center for Human Values, and Trinity College Dublin's Institute for International Integration Studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kelsey. Thanks for that uh, introduction, and I'm especially, I noted that when you said my book was published with Harvard, that you didn't make a, a face <laughs> about that. <laughs> a, uh, uh, as I understand it, what the, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. As I understand it, this microphone is for the, uh, the taping and not to amplify my voice, so can everyone hear me? All right. If at some point you can't, just give me a sign. Now, uh, Professor Wolf told me I should take about 20 minutes, and uh, I told him, as you can no doubt ascertain, I'm uh, from the American South, so 20 minutes uh, to a Southern, a 20-minute limit doesn't matter very much. Uh, <laughs> it's not that we have more to say, it just takes us longer. <laughs> but I'll do my best. I want to talk about three things. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about September the 11th, 2001 and um, reminiscences, I suppose you would say. And then second, I want to ask where we are in our conversation, scholarly and popular, about the significance of or how we ought to think about the movement Al-Qaeda and uh, related uh, movements within the sphere of Islam. And then finally I want to talk about what uh, that means for the study of religion, uh, particularly related to um, faith and the ambivalence of faith and globalization. So first, 9-11. Uh, Hard not to reminisce a little bit, uh, since we are, after all, on the seventh anniversary of the attacks on the World Trade Center and in Washington, D.C. Probably uh, a lot of the news coverage this morning where the tapes of the planes flying into the towers were replayed and uh, news footage was shown uh, in New York and elsewhere brings back memories and causes people to think about where they were and what their original reactions were. The news footage shown this morning reminded us, I think, of the initial shock at the footage shown really around the country and eventually around the world of the planes flying into the towers. First people thought there was some sort of terrible mistake when the first one went in and then a few minutes later when the second one went in people began to talk about a deliberate attack and wondering what had happened, who had carried it out. From shock to outrage, lots of talk about whether more was to come. People lived, it seemed, almost in a kind of quasi-apocalyptic atmosphere in which things were breaking and you didn't know exactly what was yet to be revealed. That last part for me, that quasi-apocalyptic feeling, or more generally the feeling of strangeness about all this, was I'm sure uh, amplified in part because I was not at home when these attacks occurred. I was not in Tallahassee. I was in Cleveland on a visiting appointment that fall. 
where I was to give, I had contracted the spring before to give six public lectures on the topic Islam and the political future, a topic that took on new meanings uh, after these events. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. Adjustments are necessary sometimes, yes. Um, but the strangeness was uh, multiplied as uh, in the coming months in Cleveland. Uh, first, almost the next day, a plane landed at the Cleveland airport and the entire airport was quarantined because the plane had left its scheduled uh, flight pattern and landed in an emergency condition. And uh, no doubt the airport authorities thought that it might be carrying a bomb. A little bit later, a prominent imam at the Islamic Center outside of Cleveland, a person who had been for some years intimately involved in ecumenical dialogue in the city, uh, was exposed by local newspapers for statements he had made some years prior to that that were, I think it's fair to say, vehemently anti-American and anti-Semitic. Um, he was, he protested that he had changed his opinions and that his ecumenical work actually represented what he wanted to contribute to the faith community, but he was ultimately forced to resign from his post. During the time of controversy over this imam, who incidentally had an adjunct teaching post at the university where I was giving my lectures, during the time he was being exposed and uh, his legacy being debated, uh, another strange thing happened. Uh, a native Clevelander, uh, evidently in a fight with his girlfriend over whether or not he was brave enough to actually do something about uh, the terrorists who had flown the planes into the trade towers and into the Pentagon, he got himself, well, in my part of the world, we would say he got himself all liquored up. And he took his car about two in the morning and drove it down the long driveway leading to the Islamic Center and crashed into the main part of the building. I suppose he thought that was a brave act. Uh, fortunately, he did not hurt anybody. There wasn't there at that time, anybody at that time of day. He didn't hurt anybody except himself. He dislocated broke both his shoulders and broke a leg, if I remember correctly. The upshot was there was a communal outcry about uh, this uh, attempt to do damage to the Islamic Center and the Islam Islamic community, and the members of the center were quite gracious, I have to say. They refused to press charges uh, with respect to this gentleman and only expressed their regret for these kinds of misunderstandings. Misunderstandings made even more strange by the fact that not long after that, a Sikh temple in Cleveland was firebombed. Evidently, the perpetrators thought that they were attacking Muslims. Strange things, feeling of strangeness about that time. And the strangeness was amplified, I think, for many people by their first glimpses on videotapes of Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri. Uh, these two fellows, uh, bin Laden, of course, speaking with that famously placid manner that he has, uh, Zawahiri, um, more excitable, uh, enthusiastic from one point of view, uh, yelling and screaming from another but them giving their messages to us in a background of wilderness somewhere in Pakistan or Afghanistan, almost as though they came from another time and place. Strangeness. Now, we moved quickly, at least many people did, from that feeling of strangeness and other feelings of outrage and shock to the question, who are these people? And that's where the second part of these remarks I want to take off. What have we learned in the seven years about bin Laden, Zawahiri, and those either with them or motivated by them or motivated by a view of the world like theirs? I think it's fair to say that in 
popular discourse and even more in scholarly discourse, we have emerging two paradigms, two ways to talk about these folks. Uh, the first we might call the terrorism paradigm, or uh, some people even like to call it terrorology, the kind of paradigm that's expressed if you were to go over to the library and pick up a journal like uh, Terrorism and Political Violence, a very interesting journal that deals with terrorism in a variety of settings and through time. Uh, this is a discourse that focuses on tactics. These are people, these were people on 9-11, uh, and as expressed in subsequent statements by bin Laden, Zawahiri, and others, these are people who are engaged in a form of indiscriminate fighting, where the ordinary rules governing the conduct of war, rules that are built in to the Islamic discourse or tradition of thinking about justice and war, even as they're built into the just war tradition, uh, familiar to Europeans and North Americans, those rules require that uh, a fighter conduct him or herself with honor, in particular by distinguishing between combatant and non-combatant targets. The terrorism paradigm fixes on the ways that Al-Qaeda and other groups violate those codes of honor and wants to understand what they're trying to do with respect to that. The other paradigm that is emergent uh, deals more with Al-Qaeda as a religio-political movement and wants to see the tactics as occurring within the framework of more overarching religio and political goals. Now myself, I hold, as it will be clear, to the second of these paradigms. I think that what we have learned in the seven years since 9-11 is that we are dealing with a Muslim religio-political movement which utilizes a particularly virulent form of irregular warfare in pursuit of its goals and which is, I think we have to say, deeply though controversially related to Islamic tradition, or deeply in terms of the course but ambivalently related to Islamic tradition. And the thing that I try to do most comprehensively in uh, my book with uh, Harvard University Press is to display the contemporary argument among Muslims that is occasioned by the tactics and claims of Al-Qaeda. Now, let me take a moment just to illustrate what it is that gives an appeal to both of these paradigms, the terrorology or terrorism paradigm and the religio-political movement paradigm on the other. First on the terrorism paradigm. In both cases, I'm going to use quotes from Zawahiri. August the 4th, 2005. Uh, Zawahiri issued a pronouncement about the 7-7 bombings in London. And he warned both uh, the people of the United Kingdom and of the United States and others, as he said, O peoples of the Crusader Coalition, we have offered you at least the opportunity to stop your aggression against the Muslims. We have offered you the Lion of Islam, the struggler, Sheikh Osama bin Laden, may God protect him, offered you a truce so that you will leave the lands of Islam. Did Sheikh Osama bin Laden not tell you that you could not dream of security before we live it as a reality in Palestine and be, before all the infidel armies leave the land of Muhammad? But you have made rivers of blood in our country so we blew up volcanoes of rage in your countries. Our message to you is clear and unequivocal. You will not be saved unless you withdraw from our land, stop stealing our oil and our resources, and cease your support of the corrupt Arab rulers. As the statement went on, um, Zawahiri warned of how many thousands of deaths would occur, threatened more acts of uh, violence, and so on. The point here is that this is the familiar voice of the terrorist. 
we get a celebration of indiscriminate attacks, threats of more to come, demands for specific kinds of action. The entire discourse, with one exception, lends itself to the analysis of those who would say this is political theater in which religion is simply a kind of add-on. The issues, the rhetoric, are in the form of those familiar from the study of international terrorist groups, like the ones analyzed in terrorism and political violence. The only feature that even gives this a shade of an Islamic character is the reference to the lands of Muhammad from which the infidel armies are supposed to withdraw. Now, of course, if you want to evaluate the terror or terrorology paradigm, that little mention of the lands of Muhammad is a pretty important add-on. It can immediately be seen to resonate with some of the great themes of Islamic tradition, where we find Muhammad fighting in the Medinan period of his ministry, roughly from 622 to his death in 632, to create a zone of security for the practice of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. If one accepts the tradition by which the Prophet sent letters to the rulers of surrounding empires before his death, inviting them to accept Islam or to come under the protection of Islam or to uh, face the challenge of war, then Muhammad planned to expand this zone of security. And so the Muslims did. In European and North American scholarship, we read of the early Islamic conquests but the mention of the lands of Muhammad actually, in pious memory, thinks of, brings up the image not of Muslim conquest, but of Muslim armies liberating the peoples of the Middle East, North Africa, and eventually a much wider territory from tyrannical governments. The early expansion of Islam, in other words, in pious memory is not a matter of conquest, it's a matter of liberation, and with it, regime change, whereby tyrannical forms of government are replaced by Islamic governments, governments in which the rule of God's law is supreme. It's interesting here that in the pious tradition about this program of liberation and regime change, once Islamic government was in place, it wasn't that everybody had to be a Muslim. And in one sense, conversion was not the direct point. Government was. No conversion might follow. The old proverb that the religion of the people follows the religion of the ruler. The Muslim texts cite that. But the point in the first place was to establish sound government. And again, in the imagination of the pious, the kind of imagination at which this reference to the lands of Muhammad is aimed, uh, in the imagination of the pious, the change of regime was not an imposition of something foreign, but a gift. For Islam, the condition by which people submit to God's guidance is the natural religion the natural condition of humanity. Even so, government by God's law is natural from this point of view. It provides the best chance human beings have to live in peace and justice. Now, as I say, that little add-on, the reference to the lands of Muhammad, it can evoke all these things that I'm talking about. Is that what Zawahri meant when he inserted that? We'll consider this address of his from 2004. True reform is based on three principles. The first principle is the rule of Sharia, because Sharia, which was given by God, protects the believer's interests, 
freedom, honor, and pride and protects what is sacred to them. The Islamic nation will not accept any other law after it has suffered from the anti-Islamic trends forcefully imposed on it. The second principle of reform is the freedom of the lands of Islam. No reform is conceivable while our countries are occupied by the crusader forces. The third principle of reform is the Muslim nation's freedom to run its own affairs. This freedom will only be realized in two ways. First, freedom of the independent religious judicial system, the implementation of its rulings, and the guaranteeing of its honor, authority, and strength. Second, the freedom and the right of the Islamic nation to implement the principle of promoting virtue and preventing vice. Now, as that quote indicates, Zawahiri is not interested in promoting violence for the sake of violence. That undoes about, well, several hundred recent scholarly interpretations of what is going on with these movements that operate in what I would call the terror paradigm. It's not violence for the sake of violence. There's a positive vision here. Whether we like it or not is another question, but there is a positive vision. And the fighting he holds is the only means to accomplish the goal. He goes on in the text that I was just uh, reading from to warn those Muslims who think that the proper reform can be put in place simply by words and di diplomacy. He says, no, it's going to take fighting to accomplish it. Zawahiri, I think, meant precisely when he spoke about the lands of Muhammad to evoke the uh, pious memories that I have spoken of. Zawahiri wants to stand, along with bin Laden and others, for government by divine law. And as he does so, he also stands against something. Democracy, for example. Zawahiri and other al-Qaeda spokespersons clearly understand democracy as government of, by, and for the people. In fact, in the famous document in the shadow of the spears by uh, Suleiman Abu Ghaith, who was for a time after the 2001 attacks a kind of, almost a kind of press secretary for al-Qaeda. Uh, you read that article and you almost think that he has read and is quoting from the Gettysburg Address when he talks about what he is opposed to. Zawahiri and others stand for government by the Sharia, and they understand that to entail standing against democracy, which Zawahiri and others hold is bad for human beings. It's important here. I don't think we want to say that this is a case of someone who misunderstands democracy. And while someone like Zawahiri is perfectly capable, in the text I was reading from and other statements, of tweaking the Western powers for inconsistencies and hypocrisy, that's not really his point either. He thinks democracy is bad for humanity. It's certainly bad for Muslims, but ultimately it's bad for humanity. And one of the reasons it's really important then for Muslims to establish a state that is ruled by divine law is so that they can carry out their mission of commanding right and forbidding wrong, of calling people to live in accord with their true nature. He's not far from evoking the famous saying attributed to the prophet, that every child is born a Muslim. It's the child's parents who make of him or her a Jew, a Christian, a Zoroastrian, or something else. If you take Zawahiri seriously, he wants to give every child a context in which he or she can hear the message of Islam and reclaim his or her natural identity. Now where we go from that is we're not looking just at a terrorist movement. It is a religio-political movement which is engaged in a particularly violent form of irregular fighting. It wants to link up with more local, or regional resistance movements around the world and to move them toward its goal of a state large enough to be a player in global politics. In terms of this course, it wants to shape 
or even control globalization. If globalization implies the advance of democracy, of capitalism, of free trade, of the regime of human rights, then governments inspired by this vision that al-Zawahiri puts forward would resist and would say they have their own vision of globalization, an Islamic one. Now what this means for the study of religion and for the ambivalence of faith. Max Weber taught us two things about religion, at least two things. First, whatever other purposes religions play, they serve to give believers a vision of legitimate social and political order. Whatever other purpose they play, they give believers a vision of legitimate and political order and inspire them to take action in accord with that vision of legitimate order. As you can tell, it's my view that Al-Qaeda has tapped into something pretty deep in pious imagination in terms of a vision of what kind of order is good for human beings, makes for their welfare in this world, and points them toward their welfare in the next. But then the second thing Weber said has to do with change or ambivalence. He writes, neither religions nor human beings are open books. They have been historical rather than logical or even psychological constructions without contradiction. Often they have borne within themselves a series of motives each of which, if separately and consistently followed through, would have stood in the way of the others or run against them head on. In religious matters, consistency has been the exception and not the rule. Weber's point is that over time we see things shift so that a vision of legitimate political and social order that seems basically to enshrine and confirm the status quo somehow gets turned on its head and supports revolutions. In religious matters, consistency is the exception and not the rule. And I think it's fair to say that contemporary Islam is in a time of crisis when Al-Qaeda and other groups are fighting for the power to define the pious imagination for years to come. This is where ambivalence, the ambivalence of faith comes in. In arguing the just war in Islam, I talk in broad terms about three groupings in contemporary Islam. And of course, one needs to refine always these kinds of typologies or groupings. The one, the militant point of view, that's the Al-Qaeda point of view. Advocates of divine law governance in the strict sense who join that goal with a particularly violent form of irregular warfare in which distinctions between combatants and non-combatants are not held to be, uh, are not held to be binding. Well, then we have the great broad center, I think, of contemporary Islamic political thought, which you might call more traditional advocates of Islamic governance, in which an Islamic religious establishment is very important, and in some sense governance by divine law is right, but who have a little bit looser view of how you derive divine law from existing precedents and sources than the militants do and who are repelled by the militant tactics. If you look at uh, Islamic websites, if you read Islamic texts, the advocates of, of, of more traditional advocates of Islamic governance are clear that they do not believe that the tactics of the militants are warranted by or consistent with Islamic tradition and this is particularly a matter of the targeting issue. Uh, for them, there are some things that the Muslim conscience just cannot approve, even if in some sense the militants are on to something about a problem in contemporary life.
Then the last group I describe as Muslim Democrats, people who read Islamic sources and who argue that it's not just the tactics of the militants that's wrong, but the whole notion of an Islamic religious establishment is problematic and needs to be put to the side. They attack, in other words, not only the means of the militants, but the goal. And they want to say that the regime of human rights is the Islamic form of government. So that if the militants tap into pious imagination by saying, talking about the struggles of Muhammad with unbelief and persecution and fighting at Medina, the Muslim Democrats want to talk about Muhammad at Mecca from 610 to 622, in which he said he was called to preach and in which he said persistently to those of his followers who said, please authorize us to fight against persecution. He said, I haven't received an order to fight. I've only received the order to preach. If the militants want to tap into uh, pious imaginations by talking about the Muslim expansion as a program of liberation and regime change, the Democrats want to say, well, you know, it wasn't all that simple and straightforward. The motivations weren't always noble, and in some way, the, the pious construction is ex post facto. The conquests take place first, and then we develop a way of saying, we've got all this power now. How should we think of it? Well, you think of it in pious terms. And the Muslim Democrats want to say, no, it's not all that clear. And by the way, they want to say, it's not also not clear that an Islamic state meant just one thing. There's a great variety of precedents here. Finally, the Muslim Democrats uh, want to almost make a charter, a political charter, out of one particular verse in the Quran. And the Zawahiri and others dispute with them about the meaning of this verse. Quran 2, 256 says, there is no compulsion in religion. And for the Muslim Democrats, this becomes a verse that legitimates religious liberty, and that then in turn becomes the first fundamental right of human beings, which leads to a way of orchestrating political order, whereby legitimate political order is in accord with international standards of human rights. Now we could go on, and perhaps we will in the conversation, to say more about variations of these groups and the crisis in contemporary Islam, crisis in the sense of moment of challenge and opportunity. But perhaps right now I've said enough to suggest the connection of 9-11 and the ambivalence of faith. So I'll stop.